Hi, I'm Karen Golden Arante with Living Histories here at Cohasset Historical Society. I'm here today with Joan Trask, a longtime resident of Cohasset, who's going to talk to us about her coming to Cohasset, her husband Harry Trask, and her raising her seven children here. Hi, Joan, how are you? Good morning, I'm fine. Um, could I ask what prompted you to come to Cohasset, you and Harry? Well, from the time we were engaged in July until we married in September, we spent a lot of time apartment hunting, and it boiled down to two choices. I could have a studio apartment over a bowling alley in Quincy, or we could have a four-room apartment with bath near the beach in Cohasset. The Quincy apartment was $50, and Cohasset apartment was $40. Which would you take? <laughs> <laughs> so now. You, Harry worked in Boston. And he worked in Boston for 41 years. He commuted from Cohasset to Boston on all his jobs. Yeah. And were they, was it a regular nine to five or was he on oh, call? We have to explain what it was that he was doing. With when Trump. we first married, we both worked at the newspaper. Of course, um, after I became enough pregnant to stay home, I did. And um, we took the train in those days. They talk about. Um, old Hingham not having trains, well, he certainly did. <laughs> I used to laugh at that. Um, we took the train up and we both worked in, in the city, but then he stayed at the Herald Trial for 27 years, um, and during that time they opened up UMass Boston. I'm getting ahead of the story a little bit, but I'll tell you that he went through UMass in four years like a regular student, days, because he was working overnight at the newspaper and coming home in between for a little sleep in a house full of seven children. <laughs> oh my gosh. He was an amazing person, he really was. So now you moved to Cohasset to Spring Street. Um, is, that, is that was your first home was here at Spring Street? I'm sorry? Your first home was at Spring Street? Yes, the apartment at Spring Street, yeah. We came down the day we were married, went to the hardware store and bought a coffee pot and made breakfast and we were in Cohasset from then on. Of course, we were looking for houses all over the South Shore, but we really would like to have stayed in Cohasset. We didn't think we could afford it. And um, as time went on, we were in the apartment for about two and a half years, and I uh, had two babies during that time. Um, and then well, what year, so you were there in? 1955. Okay, is and, when then, first came. and then 1956. Mark was born in 56 and Matthew in 57. And um, as luck so would have it, that there was a house for sale up on Bancroft Road that Harry had looked at and was very happy with, but we couldn't touch the price. And the people who were there um, were suffering financial reverses, and they brought the price down a thousand, which doesn't seem much nowadays, but at that time. They took the price down a thousand. He won the Pulitzer Prize for a thousand dollars, and we were able to move all the way from the bottom of the hill to the top <laughs> of the hill in Cohasset. And I've been in the same house ever since. Wow. So, so tell us about um, July twenty fifth, nineteen fifty six, or that morning, wee hours of the morning. Right, July twenty sixth. Do you want me to read the story? Surely. Why don't you start to read that? Harry wrote this out himself in pencil on a stenographer's pad because he didn't ever want to forget the details of that day. And I think, as I have already told you, I was so glad I didn't know all these details until long after. It was scary. Harry wrote, the first thing I knew, my wife was calling me to the phone at 2.30 in the morning to talk to Bob Kirstead from the office thinking sleepy but fierce things about a city editor who'd call a tired photographer at such an ungodly hour, I crawled out of bed to hear, Harry, there's been a crash out to sea, and I want you to get in here as soon as possible. Just then, bed seemed a lot more inviting than trying for pictures at 2.30 a.m. It was dark out, especially out over the ocean somewhere. But I managed a yawning, is it big, Bob? Two ships have collided south of Nantucket Island. More than 1,600 people involved, came the reply. Suddenly, wide awake, I said I would do what I could, hung up, and began throwing on clothes. What information I had, I passed on to my wife, adding, I have no idea when I'll get home. This story may take a couple of days to clean up. I'll keep in touch as well as I can. 
The drive from my home in Cohasset to the Boston Traveler building usually takes about 50 minutes. That night I was in the office in a half hour. There, Kirstead filled me in on the details of the crash. All he knew was that the inbound Italian luxury liner, Andrea Doria, had been rammed by the ice-cutting prow of the Swedish ship, Stockholm, outbound from New York. Both ships were still afloat, but a great many lives were in dangerous balance. Bob had contacted John Dowd, a reporter who had shared the midnight to dawn beat with me when I first became a staff photographer for The Traveler. John and I were to go to Riviera Airport where the owner, Julie Goldman, had a Piper Tri-Pacer tri and a twin Cessna for hire. The twin had been taken by a rival paper, so we got the single-engine Tri-Pacer, which is unsafe for flying over the ocean. Julie said this would take us to Nantucket, where another plane would fly us out over the wrecked ships. We took to the still dark skies at 4.30 in the morning, landed at Nantucket in an hour. Meanwhile, our rival in the twin Cessna had not been given landing clearance on the island, so he flew right out to the wreck scene. With him went our hopes for a better plane. Our pilot flatly refused our request to fly us out over the scene. He said he couldn't risk it. The Nantucket airport was a crawling confusion of planes and newsmen who had chartered them. A look around revealed not a plane left untaken. So while John buzzed here and there getting story material, I started anxiously trying to hitch a ride for us. Each inquiry brought a refusal. They were carrying extra gas and had no space. Someone else had been promised a ride. The helicopters needed room for possible survivor rescues, and so on. A little more desperate now, I even approached the Coast Guard, the Army pilots, but they couldn't take civilian passengers. All I could do was grab a few pictures of survivors being flown in as I watched rival papers, including Boston Friends, take off for the pictures of the crippled ships. It didn't help any to hear the comments as they returned, exclaiming about the terrible sight out there. By 8.30, word had come back that the Stockholm would be able to limp back to New York, but was standing by to pick up passengers from the badly listing Andrea Doria. It became clear that pictures of rescue operations and the battered ships would have to be gotten soon or the action would be all over. And there, Dowd and I were probably the only two newsmen on the island who had not been out to see what was going on. I felt bad enough standing around with no plane, no pictures at that hour, but it was worse to think of returning to the traveler with none at all. I knew our wire service coverage would provide something, yet I dreaded the shame of going back empty-handed. That's why I was ready to hug Dowd with joy when he came up with an idea that brightened the picture from black to at least medium gray. He thought of calling the traveler for a list of airports and pilots on the eastern seaboard in hopes that one pair of wings somewhere would come to our rescue. The traveler came through. The aviation editor gave John a complete list, but as more edition minutes ticked by, he called number after number in vain. Toward the end of the list was the name Bob Walker from Martha's Vineyard. Thank God he agreed to be our angel. My first look at Bob's small, single-engine Bonanza lowered my hopes a few thousand feet. I would have liked to have seen a larger, more capable-looking angel. I rattled off questions about gas, about performance, about her condition, trying to calm my jitters. Despite all the confidence and reassurance in Bob Walker's answers, I was still nervous as I put on a Mae West, another way to not be able to handle the camera. It occurred to me that I'd be putting it, on, putting it to full use if anything should happen to the plane's one engine. When about 9.30, it finally came time to take off. I was glad enough to get going, but couldn't choke down a glum, let's get it over with. We flew south through hazy skies. Visibility below was lousy. I was relieved when, after about 20 minutes, Bob said he thought he could make out the Doria dead ahead. Dowd and I peered and soon saw not the Doria, but the upright white hull of the Stockholm. Then to the left, suddenly we saw the terrible sight. It did to me what no horror movie had ever succeeded in doing. I sweated and blanched as we came upon the Andrea Doria, the $30 million sea queen wallowing on her starboard side. Even from the sky, she looked huge like a big graceful animal, wounded and rolled over in pain. Walker broke the spell by asking for instructions. I suggested circling the Stockholm for a few shots and then taking our time with the Doria. It was then almost 10 o'clock. The plane was so cramped that sitting up front with Bob, 
I had to have him lean forward each time I made a picture so that I could shoot through his window. I was crowded too close to mine. At the same time, he made the plane roll practically on its side to get the wing out of the way. We had just tried these sickening maneuvers a couple times when my heart, instead of my stomach, came up to the back of my throat. I had noticed the Doria's smokestack closer to the water than when we first saw her. She was tipped further onto her side. Bob, circle the Doria as fast and as close as possible. I want a lot of pictures. She's sinking. I was feverish and cold, soaked with sweat, aching knots in my stomach, pulled tighter as I recorded the death drama just 75 feet below. It hurt to see the big ship giving up the struggle, letting the ocean win. Each time we dove and passed, there was less and less of her. Finally, I focused on a ring of violent bubbles, and then there was no more need for pictures. It was 10.09 a.m. Altogether, we had circled the ship nine times in nine minutes. I had made nine pictures. Somewhere in the dizzy seconds, between reloading my camera and trying to keep my balance, I had noticed that no other still photographer was in the sky over the Andrea Doria just then. That meant that if my pictures were any good, I might have earned for the traveler one of those magic things, an exclusive. I began to feel excited and was anxious to get back to develop my film. Sorry, the pages are stuck together after all these years. Bob Walker sped us directly to Logan International Airport, a 20-minute taxi ride from the traveler. On the return trip, Bob confessed that even he, an XGI jet jockey, had felt nauseated, overwhelmed more by what he had seen than by the plane's gyrations. I guess John Dowd's lead story in that day's Boston Traveler expressed the personal sadness we all felt. He wrote that what he remembered most vividly of the Doria was a brilliant mosaic seahorse in one of her swimming pools that looked as if it was diving to the bottom. Back at the office, I was happy to learn that most of the ship's passengers had been rescued and all were out of danger, and I was no less happy to learn that the pictures I had made were good. All the discomforts of the day faded when the traveler replayed hit the streets with the exclusive photos of the death of a sea queen. Funny thing, the newspaper business in such breakneck competition, it isn't always being first that counts. Sometimes it pays to be the very last. That's a great story. So the photographs that we'll show um, were Pulitzer Prize winners for Harry. And what did he get for um, the Pulitzer Prize winning photographs? The Pulitzer Prize money in, in those years was $1,000. And it had just come up to that because um, another friend at the Herald Traveler had gotten a Pulitzer a few years before, and he got 500. I understand now it's more than a thousand. I don't know just what. And so that allotted, having that extra thousand dollars. That made it possible for us to buy the house on Bancroft Road. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. And so you moved up the hill with two children at that time? And I was pregnant, yes, and a dog. <laughs> Part of our move up the hill was in a neighbor's truck. Carl Festito lived next door to us, and in his landscaping business, he had an old truck which he let us use. So we made a couple trips ourselves. And then, it's, I, I just have to tell you this because it's a funny moving story. The big pieces, the refrigerator, the, the double bureau, um, Harry's desk, the things that we didn't try to move ourselves with me pregnant and everything, we called Daly and Wansa and asked them to move us. Daly and Wansa was taking a whole house full of furnishings from Cohasset to Florida, and they tacked our things on the back and drove us from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill for $75. Oh. <laughs> wow. Well, you know, the, the, the experience of the Andrea Doria is certainly in the history books today and, and certainly a part of your family um, because one of your grandchildren is named Andrea. That's Kovic. right. Mark was the baby um, six weeks old when this all happened. And I think it probably made the biggest impression on him of any, um, the, well, the others weren't there at the time, but they, uh, they were all aware of the Pulitzer Prize and that we had, I don't know, if, uh, well, we had a couple when we moved up on the hill. But as I say, it made the biggest impression. So when his first daughter was born, he named her Andrea Doria, even though 
Andrea Doria, the sea captain, was male. Right. It's one of those Stop. names yeah. that can go either way, like Carmen and, and some of the others. Yeah. yeah, his name was Kalami, and he was on the sea, as I had read about him, for 40 years. So he certainly, and this was his last journey. That, that was really... The captain, a, yes. Yeah, that was really yes. an unfortunate... It broke last, him up completely. Yeah, that was it an was unfortunate experience for your last Of course, sale. The, um, the whole trial and everything was so slanted because of the insurance companies um, that he was made to feel positively in error, mm. whereas it was the fog. It was and, pea soup. And, and it, it, right, Even though the radar was showed up on both the, uh, uh, on the Stockholm as well. And they as had the, a skilled radar reader on the Andrea Doria and they had an unskilled radar reader on the Stockholm. I have read many other books since, um, which would, you would think would certainly have a big effect there too. But the fact that they saw no fog coming up from New York Harbor and going into New York, the Andrea Doria was in fog, so she was um, blowing her fog horns and and the uh, Stockholm was not because they weren't even aware that they were going into mm. fog. And then by the time they had sight of each other, it was too late. It, yeah. No matter which way they turned, they would have hit one way or another, and it just happened to be the ice prow. Yeah, the Stockholm the, had an ice the, prow on it. Did it so much damage. Sweden. It was supposed to have been a sink-proof ship. They had many bulkheads, and they were supposed to um, not have, uh, not be able to have enough damage to sink the ship. But because the ice bow cut through so many decks that um, the, the engineering just didn't work. Mm. Yeah. So that was a topic of conversation in your household. That was a topic of conversation in your household for, for quite a few it, years. It still comes up from time to yes, time. Yes, yes. Yeah. So now, you, after you, you had seven children, and uh, when you, you went back to school after your, after your seventh child, you went back to study to get a degree or you I did. did. I told you that Harry took his um, college right while he was working for the newspaper. And then when he went for a master's down to Bridgewater, I used to go along with him and I would sit and read while he was in class. And it occurred to me that I might as well be taking a course while I'm in class. Our children here in the good cohesive school system were learning computers from the seventh grade up, and they were bringing home things called lists to me, which way back in the early days of computers, when they had only the basic language, was the way you fed the computer to make it come out a program. And um, they would show me this list and be so proud of themselves, look what I did in computer class, and it meant nothing. So I figured I want to study computers, and I did. I took a computer class down there, and then, um, at that time, the school, the elementary schools in Cohasset were taking anybody's mother who had any college degree at all as a substitute teacher. And I had a lot of experience in the Osgoode and the Deer Hill schools. It was fun. I taught everything, including art and gym and music and all day classes in the second grade and things like that. Um, but then we had a superintendent come into town who insisted that you have to have certification in order even to be a sub. So I um, went down to Bridgewater, signed up for, a, I had to take a master's program to get certified because I already had a bachelor's and they were not offering at that time a program which sometimes is offered a sat an all day Saturday thing just to get teacher certified. I, you know, I don't know if it was Harvard or which of the schools was doing that, but it wasn't available. So I absolutely had to sign up for a master's. I looked over the ch choices and decided math was for me because I had always loved math and it was the only thing I had not studied since high school. And of course they threw me into calculus for which I had no pre-calc, none of the extra help the kids get nowadays during the summer before they start college and all that. It was like learning to swim in Niagara Falls. <laughs> <laughs> but because I loved the math, I used to do a lot of work at home at night and was able to handle it. And yes, after I was certified then I was um, hired by the math lab here in Cohasset and went from there over to Blue Hills Regional for three years but it was during the riffing years and I was the last on first off but I ended up at Notre Dame Academy in Hingham which was very nice I really liked it there. That was that was that was really great to invent really what you had in you to 
take to a career that lasted all those years. It was wonderful. Well, especially teaching the girls at, um, at, at, in Hingham, I felt, I guess the way Catherine Switzer did, that um, they, have, they had an unequal um, ability in mm. math, but I think mostly it was from fear. Mm. And so my whole idea in the, in the years that I taught at Notre Dame was to make the girls not afraid of math. And there was a, a low group, the same as there would be in any school, and there was an honors group and in between. And I had the low group of um, freshmen, sophomores, and juniors, and then they went on to the department head when she got them as seniors. And she told the principal one time, that these girls are amazing. They'll take anything I throw at them. They were not afraid of math. Mm. And I, I felt good about that. So, but you got your master's degree in 1978, um, at which point your children were already off to school and you were starting your career at that point, a new career in 1978. But one of the other experiences that the family um, lived with Harry was in 1967, here in Hopkinton at the Boston Marathon, the article here says, April 19th, who says chivalry is dead? And a girl listed only as Kay Switzer of Syracuse found herself out about to be thrown out of normally all-male Boston Marathon today when a husky companion, Thomas Miller of Syracuse, threw a block, tossed the race official out of running instead Sequence shows Jock Semple official um, moving in to interrupt Miss Switzer, then being bounced himself by Miller, and photos by Harry Trask. So this was a, another. That was his other picture that went around famous, the world, right? Um, so this now at, at this point when he was at the Herald, at the Traveler, doing this as well. So if you could just give us a little bit of the story from photographing Catherine Switzer in the Boston Marathon. This is from great. her book. Yes, The Marathon, Marathon Woman. Woman. The most famous of the many photos of Jock Semple attacking me are those in the three-part series by Harry Trask of the now defunct Boston Traveler. Harry had a great eye for news and moved unflinchingly fast to capture it. The Boston series was included in Time Life's 100 Photos That Changed the World. His photos of the actual sinking of the Andrea Doria in 1956 won him a Pulitzer Prize. The Boston Traveler's photo archives were acquired by Associated Press, and Harry moved on to teach journalism, then retired to run a bait and tackle shop in Cohasset, Massachusetts. He passed away in 2002. This, this year is wrong. Many years ago, he gave me the following interview. April 19, 1967 was the date of the interview. When I came into the Traveler, this is Harry speaking, when I came into the Traveler photo office that morning, all of the good cameras were gone. We had to check out and return cameras in those days, and the guys covering the baseball game at Fenway Park got all the long lenses and motor drives. I just had a regular crank camera, 35 mil. I was annoyed by that, and also because it was a bitter, sleeting, rainy kind of day, and I had to sit on the back of the Boston Marathon's open photo track for two and a half hours. Not a great assignment. After the start of the marathon, the photo track moved from the back of the runners through to the front, with the press and the officials bus behind us. Midway through the field, in Ashland, we came upon number 261, who was clearly a girl, and we began shooting. It was the first time a girl wore numbers as far back as any of us could remember. Anyway, the next thing I saw was the bus had stopped, and Will Cloney, the race director, got out to stop the girl, but she ran on right by him. Then Jock Semple came running off the bus after her. Since I didn't have a long lens, I jumped off the back of the truck to get in closer. I knew the photo truck could have gone on and left me, but I knew Jock. Wherever Jock was, there was going to be action. It was worth the risk. I cranked off three shots as fast as I could. You never know for sure until the prints are developed, but when I saw the sequence, I was pleased. In fact, I don't think they could have been better, even with the fancy equipment. I was unaware of that. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. 
So she actually went on. She has she commented how Harry was one of the. She people. finished the race that day, and of course it it was news all over the world that a, a woman had run the for the, the first Boston time with Marathon. a number. Right, and um, Avon Company picked her up. They sponsored her because their mission is pretty much the same as her mission. She wanted to interest women all over the world in athletics. And she did. She traveled to other continents. She went to third world countries. She, um, she was mostly keen on running, of course, but she encouraged any kind of athletic endeavors for these women who, as we all know, even more now than we used to know how restricted their lives were. And finally, in 1972, Boston Marathon finally allowed women to run. So from 67 to 72, I'm sure there was a lot of commotion going on to the ultimate choice to include women. So in between there, of course, she finished college. So maybe there were some years. And then she ran some marathons in New York City and, and prepared herself even better. Yeah. The last time I talked with Catherine Switzer, she was 53 years old, and she told me she's still running three miles a day. Wow. She's quite a person. So now, you, can, you, can I ask how many grandchildren now that you have? When I see, photo, when I see your photographs of your seven children with your there's seven spouses and grandchildren, and how many grandchildren do you have now? A very un-American number. We have 23. Oh, and do you have great-grandchildren? I have 10 great-grandchildren. 10 great-grandchildren. The family just grows and grows. It does. It's a wonderful family. I love, I love watching, um, well, through photographs, which your children even photograph are big with cameras. They're too. very checky. <laughs> yes, very, very. Thank so, you for the compliment. So it's wonderful to see. Um, and it's been wonderful to, to hear your story and to hear Harry's story and lots of photographs to share, um, which, you know, I think people will look at and say, oh, I remember that photograph, and now they're going to know Harry Trask took maybe, that photograph. And maybe it will clarify with some people who still today will say to me, oh, wasn't my husband the one that took the pictures of the Titanic? <laughs> <laughs> he was not alive then. And they, they also think that he won the Nobel Prize. No, it was the Pulitzer Prize, yeah. which is so a newspaper now award. Now we've got that clarified for sure. But Joan, I really appreciate your taking the time and coming down today to speak. You're quite welcome. It was wonderful. You it made was, it enjoyable. And it was enjoyable to hear your story. Thank you. Thank you. So this is Living History at the Cohasset Historical Society. Thank you.